Um, I'm just going to go through the instruments so you so you know what you've actually got in front of you. Uh, and then today we'll also look at the sitting position. Uh, and yeah, just what our left hand and our right hand does. And then when we break out into the groups, then I can go into a little bit more detail on that. So first of all, sitar. So all the sitars are somewhat different. Um, this one here... Uh, it's a fully decorated one, but they usually have the same amount of strings. They have roughly between either 18 to 20 strings. This one's got 20 strings. Let's have a look at this Mizrab first of all. So it needs to go on your finger. So on your right hand, so your index finger, and then it goes on this way round. So if you can see, it slides on the top, and if you go down, this is roughly where the knuckle is. I don't know if you can see that. Around like that. Okay. So they all come in different sizes. So this is quite important. So if there's any guitarists out there, you know, the guitarist, you've got a, a pick that you hold and you strum. So the guitar technique is more of a strumming technique. The sitar technique is very different. So we have to, um, we use this plectrum and it has to be almost like a part of our finger. So we're not holding it. We're actually just using our fingers to pluck the string in this way uh, without using the wrist. So that's with your right hand. We put this Mizrab, just the one. It's called the Mizrab, it's plectrum. It goes on your index finger. So, sitting position. I take it we're all relatively quite young, and you're probably younger than me, but the idea is that we have to sit like this. So what, I've done, what I'm doing, if you can sit cross-legged on the floor, uh, you need to put your right leg on top of your left leg like this. I'll explain why in a second. What this enables us to do uh, is get the sitar to rest on our foot. So, let's just pick up the sitar. And if you can see, I rest the sitar on my left foot. That's why I've taken my sock off, because if you have your sock on, it will just slip off. So, the sitar is resting on my left foot. This is my right foot here. And then with that resting there, and then the neck, the bottom of the neck is resting up against my right leg here, just on my knee. So then I've got an anchor between these, these three points, one, two, and three on my leg. When I put my arm on the top and rest it on the top, I have a complete hold of the instrument. Now, however you sit, you could sit cross-legged. You could sit and swing your legs out like this. This is what some females, if they're wearing a sari, they'll sit like this. It doesn't matter too much, but you need to make sure that your left hand is free. So your left hand cannot be holding the instrument up because otherwise it's going to go out of tune. So that's why sitting like this is the best way. On that uh, left foot there, arm round on the top and rest on the top of the sitar. So what we do with our thumb on this right hand is that there's a pattern that goes at the back of the instrument. Now mine's sort of quite decorated but if I turn it round, ah, God, there we are. I can see I've got a pattern here that goes along. But sometimes you'll see something that stops here but there's a change from here to here. Now that bit there, where that pattern stops, is where you place your thumb. So once again, we're sat like this. Our right arm goes on the top and our thumb rests in this place here. So it'll be, if I come in really close, be almost like this, thumbs resting there. The next hard thing is the right hand technique. So I'm going to have a look at the right hand technique, then we'll have a look at the left hand technique, then I'll go back and explain all the parts of the instrument. So what we have to do is we need to keep our fingers together when we pluck the strings. So we need to get used to this motion here. I'm going to do it here. Now, if you see how those fingers stay together, your tendency is going to think, well, this is my Mizrab, so I'm going to do play like this. The trouble is, if you play like that, number one, you won't get enough uh, power and number two you could probably give yourself tendonitis because 
your tendons up here will be straining. So the idea by doing this is that we share the load between all the tendons. So, with, once again, the sitting position. So I've got my right foot on there, the sit arrest on my right foot, my left, sorry, my, my left foot, and my right foot is here, and it's resting on my right knee. My thumb is in that place here. And then I just want you to have a go, feel the strings, and try and pluck upwards while keeping those fingers together. Make sure your thumb stays in this position here. Your thumb doesn't come off. You can see by doing this, you have two strokes. One is up, one is down. So we've got da, the up stroke is called da, and the down stroke is called ra. So we've got da, ra, da, ra. So, there's only one more stroke that we need to worry about, and it's a Chikari stroke, which is a top string, but we'll do that later on. But fundamentally, with the right hand, there are only three strokes. So there's not that much to worry about. But this technique of keeping those fingers together when you play is really, really important. It means you will get that power. Give you the power that you need. So, moving on, left hand. So what we do is we make a C shape, like this, and then we turn it round and we place our thumb on the strings at the back. You see this, there's threads that are tying on the frets. So we place our thumb on those uh, the threads that's tying on the fret, and then where our thumb is, is where our first finger is, because they're both in line. They're not like this, not like this, they're in line. So I know that where my thumb is, is where my first finger is. So I'm looking at the back of the instrument. I'm looking at my thumb with my left hand. And with your left hand, you only use two uh, fingers, these two fingers. And you only really play on one string. So, although we've got lots of strings on the sitar, we only really play on one string. You've probably got your sitar and thought, oh my gosh, there's so many strings, what do they all do? We can break down our strings to three sections. So, the first section is our main playing string. So it's the one which is, um, if I'm looking here where the pegs are in front of me, and I'm looking across, it's the one that's furthest away. So you can see that all the strings run on one side of the neck. And then we've got a gap on the other side. So we've got a gap this side and this side, the top part, and you can see all the strings. So it's the one that's the bottom one, the, the one that's furthest away from there. Um, is that tuned to D? Um, I ask. So this one, I'm tuned to C sharp. I will talk a bit about tuning in this session. Um, if you're musicians or you play another instrument, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, if not, we'll still get through it, but it's it takes a lot to tune these instruments. We'll, we'll get on to that. Um, so, we uh, have that main playing string here. That's the one I said that we only use two fingers on. Then we have a string after then, which is a bronze coloured string. This is traditionally called a jury. The jury uh, was generally, in the old days, you used to have two of them. Jury means double. But this is like a drone string. The other strings that we have are the three or four, depends what style of sitar you have, top strings. So there's the strings right at the top of this side, not the bottom, here. And so those are the three string, three um, sections of the strings. But then there are three sections of the strings that are on the top, because you will see that we have between 10 or 13 little pegs here that run along, and each one of these pegs is attached to one of the strings underneath. So not only do we have maybe six or seven, it depends, probably six strings you've probably all got on the top, we have 
13 to between 10 and 13 strings that run underneath. So you will also find, you probably realize, that the sitar is very light. Uh, this is a good thing and it's a bad thing because it does mean it's not really made of much. Inside the wood, this part here is wood and it's made of two parts, it's hollow. This part here is a gourd, which is like a butternut squash, is very delicate. It is very delicate. So for keeping your instruments, I would suggest if you're not using it, put it back in a soft case, put it somewhere safe, uh, because they, they are very, sort of very delicate and it doesn't take much uh, for them to break. Actually, uh, you won't be able to see, but this peg here is slightly different from this peg here, different in design. That's because I was coming back from Russia last week from a tour and this one is from a different sitar because literally they did this to my wonderful peg. So you can see it's just been snapped in two. So you've got to be very careful with these instruments. Um, you will break a string. They break all the time. Don't worry about it. I can show you how to... Um, to pair them and I don't know if you've got any spare strings, probably not. You've been given them, so I can sort that out. So if you get the string breakage, if it's one of the small ones underneath, don't worry about it. If it's one on the top, then maybe we need to get that sorted out. But um, strings are very cheap. They're just wire and you just buy them in massive coils like this. I've got loads of the stuff, so it's not much to it. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, we've gone through the strings, <clears throat> we've gone through what it's made of, uh, yeah, so this doubly here, um, this is basically our soundboard, so this is really quite important. If you crack this, then we're in big trouble, basically you lose the sound of the instrument. If you smash the gourd, it's repairable, because if you keep the pieces, then you can glue them back together, then you put a bit of wood filler on it and you sand it and paint it and then it would be absolutely fine, should be fine. Let's go on to the frets. So if you can see, all the frets at the top part here are all uniformed in, in their distance between each other. Until we come to this place here and then you'll see there's a bigger gap and then they're uniformed again. And let me move that because it's going to confuse everyone. Then, and then we have another big gap, bigger gap. And then we have four, which are together. And then we have a, then they sort of space out a bit more after then. So there's two reasons for this. Um, number one is great. Well, the, one of the main uh, benefits of this is that we know where our main note is when we play the sitar. Because it's in between this, these, this gap. And it's this side of the gap. So you can see the gap here. There's my big gap. And it's there. So that's our main note. Um, which we'll come on to in a bit. So, yeah, so the, the other reason we have these gaps is that we don't need these extra frets. We don't need these extra notes here. So we can either have, we can either have this one here, or we can have it here. And if we wanted to put move it there, we just move the fret. There we go. I've just moved the fret. And I'll move it back because they're just tied on with thread at the back. Now, you won't need to do that yourselves for quite a while um, until we change some of the scales or ragas that we're gonna play, um, which means you, we will have to get used to changing. But the frets, if a fret falls off, it doesn't really matter because you just tie it back on. And I, you could see that I've tied one back, oh, you know, not will see that, it's too dull. But this one here, that, that one there is a different color to the others. That's because that one fell off couple of weeks back and I had to tie it back on. It doesn't look pretty, I can't do it very well, but it, it's staying on. So once again, the frets, they won't fall off, but if they do, um, don't worry about it too much, we can get that sorted out. So the frets are movable. So you can slightly move them, adjust them if you wanted to. I can move them if they're slightly, if it's slightly sharp or flat, I can just slightly move it. So you've noticed that um, when you listen to sitar, it has this very, uh, what's the word for it? Bendy sound? Is that the right word? No, probably not. Uh, glissandy, if you want to be technical. Or what we call it, means. 
So that's why we've got all of these strings running on one side of the neck. Here, we've got the strings, then we've got this gap here. And that gap there enables us to get that first string and to pull it. So we could pull quite a bit. Um, and if the more we pull, the higher the pitch goes. So not only can we go this way and play the notes. So let me give you an example. So I could play. So that's just up and down. Then we go. So. Pull. So we can go up and down this way and we can also pull the string as well to get our pitch. So that's that's pretty tricky. So fundamentally with the left hand we have we know that our thumb stays in this one position here um, and our first finger is in line with that thumb and we can go up and down this way to get whichever note we want. Or, or we can pull. So we've got two ways of doing it. So let me let me wrap up tuning, then I can go on to a bit of theory on that side. So my sitar is tuned to C sharp. Now, if you've got an Android phone, there's a wonderful app. And if you've got an iPhone, there's also a wonderful app, and they're both free. My one's called Tampura Droid. So if you can see, yeah, there we go. At the top it says C sharp, and then it's got bar is the name of the note. And if I turn that on, so it's giving me this drone sound. Now, that is C sharp, C sharp is the name of the note. And then you can hear they sound the same. So my sitar is tuned to C sharp. There is a way of tuning it. We tune the first string, the second string, should I say, to C sharp. This is G sharp, C sharp, C sharp. So if you can get away with just tuning one, two, three, four, and then your main string, which is F sharp. So F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, C sharp, C sharp. Now, if you don't know much about music, that probably means absolutely nothing to you, but then I can go through that with you. So that's, um, that's, that's fine, don't worry about it. So the strings underneath, don't have to worry about it for tuning. Really don't worry about it. Even if your Chikari strings go a bit out, these top strings here, that doesn't matter too much. But your first string and your second string really, really need to be in tune. Let me talk about what we actually play on the sitar. We play something on the sitar called a raga. Now, a raga is like a scale, a musical scale. We play something called a raga, which is like a musical scale. So you get your guitar out, you do your D major scale. So what we do is we take some of these notes from a scale and then we improvise on it. So what I want to do within this eight week course is to try and get you improvising in an Indian style. To try and get you to play Indian music. Um, and fundamentally, Indian classical music is 90% 90, 90 of it is improvised. So I want to give you those tools to be able to improvise. Yes, we have to learn how to play the instrument. So yes, you will get exercises because that's the way it goes. Um, and you will have to practice <laughs> um, as we all do. But um, we'll talk about structuring your practice as well. Um, because I'm, it doesn't mean you do seven hours practice a day because it's impossible. Um, so anyway, going back to the ragas. So what we do is we play these ragas. Now, the, the thing is, is, is I call it structured improvisation. What I mean by that is that you have to start in a certain way. 
and you gradually get faster and faster. And then also there are points where we play with a tubler player. So the tublers are those drums that you probably see um, alongside playing with sitar. Um, and those drums give a rhythmical cycle. So when you're reading Western music, for argument's sake, you start there and then you're going to go da, da, ba, ba, and you're reading along. Whereas Indian music, is, uh, the rhythms are cyclic, so they go round and around. I'll do it that way so you can see. So it will start at the top and it just goes round on a certain number and comes back to beginning. So this circular motion means that we can dip in and out of our improvisations and do what we want. So that's the idea. Now, you can imagine that from C sharp here to C sharp at the top, I've got all these different... Uh, frets that I can use. Um, so I could do a very basic rug. Now I can miss a few of those notes out. That's called Bupali, which is like a pentatonic. Uh, if you play guitar, you might use it for improvising. Here's another one. Hans Wadani. So these are all using the same notes, and I can change one of those notes. Or change another one. So you can see that these different combinations give you hundreds of different rounds that we learn and that we play. Okay, so let's have a go at learning the first note that we play on the sitar. So if you've got your sitar, if you could pick it up and remember the position. So put the sitar on your left foot and then arm round here so your arm, and then your thumb. Remember, rest in this position. You miss rubbing, keep those fingers together. And then we're going to look at this first note. So remember I talked about all of the frets being uniform, apart from when you come to here, where there's a gap. So we're going to put our finger just behind the fret. Let's get in a bit closer. There's my big gap there. So just behind the fret. And you can feel your finger rest up against that fret. And then with that finger pu pushing down on, that f uh, on the string, we're just going to pluck that first string. Now remember your thumb. Remember where your thumb should be. Yes, good. <laughs> then, just get used to that. So you don't put the finger, don't put it on the fret. It's just behind the fret. Good. And then let's just imagine that we could all do that. We'll do more of this in the groups. Then we're going to slide down. And just try the next fret. So, if we could just slide down, get used to that sliding in between. Now, after a while, you probably find that it starts to just burn slightly onto your fingers. The idea that, that your finger goes between these two uh, or whichever fret you might want after a while you can imagine that this is going to burn a bit so we need to make sure at the beginning that we push down as little as possible so if you push down too too little you get that sound but if you gradually push down you eventually make a sound and you realize that you don't have to push down that much to make that sound. Now, what that does, it means that you can really glide over. You'll be able to just glide over that string. Now, the other thing that you could use, if you find it a bit difficult to glide over,
coconut oil. Now, I got this lovely, lovely little pot when I was in Morocco for a concert, um, which is really nice. Look, look, it's really nice. The only trouble is, is that I stood on it and uh, sort of broke it a bit. But inside, I've got some cotton wool. And it's gone a bit green, but <laughs> that's actually what I do is I soak the um, cotton wool in the coconut oil and then I put it in this little pot. And then what you do is you dip your two fingers and your left hand on there and then you rub it on the string. And what that does, it makes it easier to glide up and down the string. So, although I'm not going to lie to you, it can be a bit uncomfortable playing the sitar. I mean, I've been doing it for 30 years, so I'm, I'm sort of used to it now, but you just got to get used to that little bit of um, pain. Um, but I, I would recommend that at the beginning, if you practice like five, ten minutes a day, and then gradually build it up if you're, you know, if you're enjoying it. Um, but you don't need to blitz it at the beginning. That way you'll build up a bit of strength in your fingers um, so they'll be able to take the, uh, the pressure, the pressure of it. So getting back to that first note. So once again, sitar's up here, resting on this part of my knee. I should be able to hold the sitar. Look, this hand is completely free and I'm just using one finger in the right place of my right hand to be able to keep the instrument locked in this knee here. And my foot is resting on my foot. And when I put my arm around where my finger was just then, it's completely free. Now, uh, a little trick of the trade, um, which is really disgusting, but um, it's, it's a really good tip that if your feet, if you say, I've been using some wonderful talcum powder and your feet are very nice and silky and smooth and you find that the sitar is just keeps on slipping off your foot. What you do is you use a little bit of spit <laughs> and you rub it on your foot and then you rub it on it and that will stick it in place. Not very nice, but it does work. Um, so once again, we've got our first note there, sa. Remember, just behind the fret. This time, what we're going to do with our right hand is we're going to pluck this first string. We're going to go. Then we're going to bring all of our fingers up. And then with a down stroke, we're going to hit these top strings. So play the first string. Up. Down. And the Chikari strings. I'll have a look at this when we break out into the groups. I'll be able to look at it um, a bit better. But for the moment, I'm just going to demonstrate what, what we're going to do. Now, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on this first string here. And then we're going to go up and down. Up, down. Now you can see that my fingers are together and it's almost like a machine. The other thing that you'll be, probably be able to hear is that is my second string because I play and clip my second string as well. If you concentrate on that first string like this, it doesn't free up your hands. And you will never get any power. So you can hear that second string. If I was going to play just the first string, it sounds like that. But you won't be able to play very fast if you try and constrict into this tiny little motion here of playing the first string. So really just open it out. Up, down. Da, ra, da, ra. So now we have da, chick. We're going to call that chick. Then we got ra. So we got da, ra, da, chick. Da, ra, da, chick. Da, ra, da, chick. Da, Ra and Chick. 
three strokes and that's all we have with our left uh, with our right hand should i say so it's it's not that hard to remember it can be complicated because we have different combinations that we use but just remember da ra and then we got chikari as well there are a few golden rules um one of the most important rules is that we don't do ra so remember da is up ra is down so we don't do Ra, and then Chikari. And this just makes complete sense, because if you're here, Ra, my hand is right down at the bottom here, and I'm going to get right to the top to hit the Chikari string. It's too much work. But if I do a Da stroke, up, then my fingers are already halfway there to do a Chikari. So if we had to go up, so if you went... Da, da. You see, if we had to go sa, this is my main note, sa, sa, chick, I wouldn't go da, ra, chick, I'd go da, da, chick. And I would do two da's, up, up, chick, so I can get the ch chikari in there. So, there is actually one other stroke pattern that we use, it's called diri. But all it is, is da, ra, double speed. But it's easy to say diri. So we go up down so we've got up up down up down da diri da ra but fundamentally it's diri is just up down da ra fast but da ra da ra da ra is harder to say and diri 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 is a lot easier to say so right hand up down chikari that's it nice and easy so we played our first note and i asked you to slide down this way to the next note. So, each note that we play on the sitar has got a name. So, sa is our first note. Re is our second note. Ga third. Ma and pa. Da ni, and then we're back to sa. So, sa re ga ma pa da ni sa, which is just like the do re mi, um, and we just call this sa re ga ma pa da ni sa. Um, let me show you the where these actual frets are, because you'll see that I wasn't playing all of these frets. If I play them all, slightly chromatic that means I'm, it's sounding like I'm playing all the divisions in between so we have to go sa re it's quite easy because sa and re are together then we have to miss one out to ga so sa re ga we play the next one which is close to it ma sa re ga ma then we miss one out to pa then we play the next one, da. Miss one out, ni. And then we're back at sa. So I think the easiest way of remembering these is through patterns. That you can see we play either side of the big gap. So this gap here, we play this one, this one. Then we got a, a whole lot of frets here until we get to the next gap. So we play either side of the the, uh, the spacings and the two in the middle. So one here, one here, two together, and then one at the end. This one, this one, this one out, two together, one at the end. Then we play the other side of the big gap. So we're playing either side of these big gaps, miss one out, and then we've got two little ones together here. So that's the way I learned. I mean, everyone, I guess, is different, but for me... I was able to see the pattern by looking, oh, there's a big gap there. I play either side of that. There's a whole lot of frets here. I play the two in the middle, one on either outside, and then, then the two, oh, well, there's a bigger gap down here. Miss one out, then I'm back to knee and then sa. Good. So, yes, there are lots of other frets as well, which we will get onto um, at some point when we're learning different um, rags. Um, so, I mean, those are the, basically the fundamentally, that's, that's the basics of the sitar. 
the instruments, um, how many strings are, and what each string does. Uh, we've looked at the sitting position. We looked at our left hand position. Um, I said we only use two fingers. And we use our second finger um, not that often. So the idea is that if we're going up, so I'm going to go sa, re, da, ma, pa, then back down. So when we get to the top, that means where we're, where we're actually going to go back down. That is where we use our second finger. I'll show you again. So I'll do it incorrectly first. This is wrong. Now what we do here, put your second finger down. So you can see I'm using my second finger because I'm not going any higher. I cannot do this. You get more clarity and control if you use your first finger. Second finger, because I'm going back down. The other thing is, when I put my second finger down, I do not take my first finger off. So don't do this. Why? Why take your first finger off when all you've got to do is put it back down afterwards? As opposed to... It's too much work. Everything in sitar technique is to make it as easy as possible. And I'm a bit of a sucker for technique, but i tell you why. Because if you get your technique right, everything else becomes so much easier later on. One thing I haven't talked about is the history of the instrument and where it actually comes from originally. So, I don't know what the history of India is like, but the uh, Siddhar was first mentioned um, about 300 years ago. This is a Siddhar from 18, 1820. Now, if you look at it, I'm getting close. Look how different it looks. And it looks more like a Turkish instrument called the Zaz. So that's Patna in 1820. Uh, I don't know if they've got any earlier pictures. Yeah, there's somebody here playing the sitar. So uh, let's move it along. There she is. Right. So you can see how she's holding it. She's holding it more like a guitar than a sitar. So you can see that actually the early sitar was so different. And what it was, it was used as like a rhythm guitar that we have in rock bands nowadays. But they would basically just accompany the singer. So the singer would um, singing along and then we would use these stroke patterns like this. And all of our stroke patterns when we go up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, things like this come from those early days you've got to remember in those days they didn't have steel strings they had probably gut strings so it's usually made from cat or goat gut um, which give you a softer sound and also they weren't be they weren't able to pull the string so it wasn't until around 120 years ago 130 years ago that they enabled the sitar to add all of these strings and the ability to be able to pull the string which you can't you couldn't do a long time ago uh, the other thing se da so se means three and da means string se da three strings um, and it originally came from Persia which is in Iran nowadays and then they the Mughals sort of invaded from Iran into Iraq, Pakistan, and all of that North India. So that means that North Indian music is very different from South Indian music. So when they invaded, they only got far, so far down. And let's just take Mumbai as sort of a line. So above 
uh, north of that is where we get the Siddhar, we get the Dabla, Sarangi, Bansuri, Sarod. Below then, you know, in South India, we get the Veena, they have the Valen, vocals, they have Madangram, Gatam, completely different instruments. Uh, the Morsing as well, and the music's very different as well. So what we're learning is North Indian uh, music, not, not South Indian music. And it's developed, so in the last 50 or 60 years, it's developed quite a bit as a music because with the invention of microphones, they are able to get onto concert halls and to play more flamboyantly. So because when you play the solo, you don't play in an orchestra or an ensemble, everyone's a soloist. So when you go on stage, it's usually you, you probably by yourself or you with a tabla player. And your tabla player is accompanying you. So you as a sitarist, you're the boss. And you've got to tell them what to do. So, uh, yeah, you've got to have a bit of that confidence on stage to be able to, to hold it and to be able to play what you need to play. Um, one thing I didn't say about all these different ragas. So there's one important thing about ragas called rata, which is a mood. So we've got all these different ragas, but each rag has to be played at a certain time of day. So we get evening rags, late evening rags, midnight rags, very late, so like two in the morning rags. We get sunrise rags, we get late morning rags, we get uh, noon rags, early afternoon, late afternoon, sunset, and they all have to be played at certain times of the day. So we have these all these different rugs and each one creates its own mood. I'll give you an example actually. So this is a morning rug. So it's quite slow, sad, I guess. Well, you've just woken up. Um, then you have midday rugs. So this, the midday rugs are quite happy, actually. Afternoon rugs, so we could get Maduvanti. <laughs> Evening rugs, Yaman. Ah, uh, no, that's not the wrong composition. Let me think. Uh, oh. Then we get into late night rugs. This very obscure sort of sounding rag, uh, but very beautiful called Mawa. Um, so we have all these different rags, these different moods. Um, not only do I want you to be able to play a bit of the sitar as well, I would also like you to be able to listen to Indian music, be it on YouTube, be it on Spotify, whatever, and think, oh yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know what's happening here. Because when you understand the music, it really becomes really great fun.